Energetic. Welcome to Men Talking Mindfulness with your hosts John McCaskill and Will Schneider. Here we focus on helping men and those with men in their lives solve some of life's complex challenges through understanding the practices of mindfulness and how they can help. Each episode is in an environment free of judgment and criticism with a focus on authenticity and inner peace. Let's dig in. Hey, I'm just a voice today, no video, but hey, it can hurt to go through life with your heart open, but not as much as it does to go through life with your heart closed. That's from Dr. James Doty in his powerful book, Into the Magic Shop, the neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Hello and welcome to Men Talking Mindfulness. I'm John McCaskill. Again, just a voice this week. I'm coming to you from San Antonio in a hotel room, so we decided to keep it just voice. <laughs> it's not a great video setting. Uh, anyhow, each week, my co-host, Will Schneider, and I work to break down and demystify an aspect of mindfulness and make it meaningful to you this week. We are with neurosurgeon and New York Times bestseller, Dr. James Doty. And we'll be digging into those mysteries of the brain and secrets of the heart. Before we do that, though, I'm going to turn it over to Will for any announcements. Just going to keep it short. I help, please help us grow the show. If you're listening or you know, if you're watching live right now, if you're listening, hey, take a screenshot uh, and share it in your Instagram or whatever kind of social platform you use. And let your not audience know uh, what you're up to and that you support and you love what we're doing here at Men Talking Mindfulness. And what also helps to get our rankings up is leave a review as well, whether it's on the Spotify platform or you're listening on Apple Podcasts. I really appreciate it because uh, the work that we're doing, John and I, uh, to bring more mindfulness and make it more accessible for people um, is, uh, is growing. And uh, we want to reach more people and we can use your help. So thank you for that. There you go. And, and it's... Uh, you know, with that in mind, as far as the work that we're doing, the work that Dr. Doty is doing in this in this world, in this arena is just uh, unbelievably profound. So Dr. Doty is a professor on the faculty at Stanford University, where he founded and is the director of the Stanford Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, or C-Care, of which His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is the founding benefactor. He is also you know, just kind of side gig, if you will, a, a neurosurgeon, a neuroscientist. He's an army veteran, an inventor, a philanthropist, and an author. And I just found out today, he's also a podcast host. His book and his podcast are both entitled Into the Magic Shop. And the book has received positive reviews from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, John Kabat-Zinn, Ariana Huffington, Rick Hansen, and Deepak Chopra. Again, just some just some small names out there. <laughs> and that's just to name a few. He's also got a new book on the way and a mental health app coming out too. So he's he's kind of busy. So we're very excited to have Dr. Doty on the sh show today. Thank you so much, Dr. Doty, for being here with us. Thank you for making some time for us. Again, you're a very busy man. And uh, that said, as we do on every episode, we're going to start out with an opening practice. Will, I'll turn it back over to you, brother. Yeah, we're going to cut this. We're going to change our opening practice. Just we're going to do five breaths, five grounding breaths practice is all we're going to do to start every show from here on out. Maybe it'll change in a year or so. But, uh, you know, these grounding practices and these just these five breaths are going to help you and help us to ground the show a little bit and kind of get us, get us centered and focused. But you can use this breathing technique anytime that you need to find more grounding and more focused as well. So yeah, stop what you're doing, sit if you like, or uh, if you're standing up, you can just keep, mow the grass and do this breathing technique. So let's start with a nice little exhale out the mouth. Take a nice big inhale through the nose, big breath, and exhale out the mouth. Good, big breath in for five seconds, four, three, big breath, two, uh, exhale out. Push it all the way out, empty as much as you can. We got three more in for five seconds. Out. Two more in. Out. One more of those. Inhale really big. Exhale. Good. And notice that's changed at all. Maybe get a little 
pulled above the stress a little bit. Open your eyes if they were closed. And uh, uh, Jim, Dr. James Dowdy, thank you for being with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, um, is my screen moving on your side? I, I, it looks like I'm frozen. But on the other side, I'm not frozen. So your, I don't know your screen going. is really good over here, but we have that mic problem again <laughs> that we had at the top of the show. So I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, uh, it will magically fix itself, I think. Or at least right, I hope we're going to manifest that. We're yeah, manifest exactly. That it fixes. That's, <laughs> that's our intention. That's yeah, right. For sure. That's right. Well, hey, again, Dr. Doty, so honored to have you here with us. And, uh, you know, we want to talk about the book, but we don't want to ruin the book. It's an excellent read and we, we highly recommend it. And as we covered before, you know, it's got, uh, you know, high, high acclaim from such phenomenal uh, people in this space. We're going to touch on what you cover in the book, but also some other things so we can leave the meat and potatoes of the book for the audience to read later. That said, it's it's kind of um, it's impossible not to cover some of what's in the book while having the discussion with you. So I'd love if you could if you could just briefly start by telling us about the magic shop that you walked into at one point earlier in your life. I think you were 12, uh, if I remember correctly, and and the magic that you learned in that magic shop. Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, so just to preface that by uh, making a statement um, that all of us carry baggage uh, and uh, uh, as a result of that, it often has a huge uh, impact on who we become and how we act every day. So at the age of 12, I uh, had had uh, a challenging background. My father was an alcoholic. My mother had had a stroke when I was a child and was partially paralyzed, had a seizure disorder. And... Um, as a result, uh, she ended up being chronically depressed, attempted suicide. We had been evicted from various residences. Uh, we were on public assistance. And in that context, of course, as a child of 12, uh, I had a sense of despair, hopelessness, and lack of direction. And so what would often happen in my house if there was an argument or something going on I uh, actually get on my bicycle and ride as far and as fast as I could away from my house. And on one of those trips, I ended up uh, uh, at a strip mall, and there was a magic shop there, which I had an interest in, and I went in. And at the counter was uh, a woman, uh, somewhat overweight. Uh, I, I call her an Earth Mother type, which those okay. a little bit older know what that means. Um, and she had these glasses resting on the tip of her nose and a chain around her neck and she was reading a really thick paperback but she looked up and here i was sort of this insecure uh child and uh she greeted me with this radiant smile and the reason i say that is that how somebody interacts with you can change everything mm. uh, because first of all all of us are in fear of judgment and if you're already insecure and from a traumatic background like my own, you're always uh, highly alert and suspicious because from my background, I never knew what was going to happen from moment to moment or who I could or could not trust. And so when this woman greeted me with this smile and we began a conversation, she immediately set the tone and that tone was one of acceptance non-judgment. And as a result, uh, she created an environment of psychological safety where I felt uh, comfortable talking to her. And this led to her asking some actual questions about my background, which generally I would not share with people. And then it led to a further discussion. Uh, and after about 15 or 20 minutes, she said to me, I really like you. And I think I could teach you something that could help you. I'm here for another six weeks, and if you show up every day, um, we can hang out, and uh, I'll teach you these things. Um, and of course, as a 12-year-old, I had really no understanding of what she was particularly talking about. 
but there were two uh, or maybe three motivating factors. One was she was giving me chocolate chip cookies. Uh, <laughs> you left that out of the book, I think. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, 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 it's in there. It's okay. in there. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, she made me feel comfortable. And, and three, uh, she wanted to help me. And uh, on some level, I knew I needed something although I wasn't sure what that was. And this led us to spending an hour and a half or two hours every day for the next six weeks. And fundamentally, that interaction changed the uh, trajectory of my life. Yeah, it was, uh, I really enjoyed, well, it was amazing that, that like it takes really six weeks to, to start to form a new habit and re- begin to develop, you know, new way of being. Um, you, would you be able to take us through those like three, pri- I thought it was really interesting, like, just to get you, can you talk about the first part of her just getting you to breathe and relax and, and, and sure. how revelatory that was for you like at such a young age? Yeah, again, uh, <clears throat> I did not realize that I actually had no idea of how to be present. And mm. what happens is that when you're thinking about the past of what could have been, might have been, should have been, Mm-hmm. or a future which has not occurred yet, but you're fixated on outcomes, you're never really present. And so I was always in one of those spaces uh, because, again, I never knew what was going to happen. And, you know, people who go through these situations as a child oftentimes have what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. That is not just limited to veterans. That occurs in any situation where there is a a constant trauma and uncertainty. And so the first thing she taught me uh, was actually uh, what is uh, a traditional mindfulness practice of relaxing the body or doing a body survey. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first thing she taught me. And uh, I had never appreciated that all my muscles were tense all the time. And so we went through that practice, starting at your toes, going to the top of your head. And to be frank with you, uh, look, I mean, for a 12-year-old, uh, that's very unusual. And, uh, uh, you know, I was sort of thinking, wow, this is really bullshit. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, though, I persisted. And, you know, I realized that I was becoming more relaxed. And the nature of that was I was able to more clearly interact with her. But, you know, to really attend and be present, uh, you have to be able to not respond to oftentimes a negative dialogue in your head. And one of the ways to help with that and to shift you from engagement of um, uh, your sympathetic nervous system, which is causing all the stress and anxiety and uncertainty, is to do a breathing exercise. So that was the next thing she taught me. So once I could relax, I could attend and breathe. And then that shifted me from engagement of my sympathetic nervous system to engagement of my parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. And suddenly uh, uh, my heart was slowing down. Uh, I could attend. Uh, I understood what she was trying to to tell me. And... uh, uh, And of course, these are the two fundamental aspects of a traditional mindfulness practice as, uh, Mm -hmm. of course, uh, promoted by John Kabat-Zinn and others. Mm -hmm. The problem with that retrospectively, and I've had discussions with John Kabat-Zinn about this, is those are great practices. And, And being able to just sit and have this, if you will, the negative dialogue and events just pass you by without you, you know, diverting your attention to them. That's wonderful. The problem with me, uh, with that, and what she actually taught me back then, was that you can get the physiologic effects from these types of practices, but there's a lot more. And when John Kabat-Zinn created this practice, which of course is from a Buddhist practice, he deleted the explicit aspect of compassion. Mm. And when you do a mindfulness practice, if you don't include that, these types of techniques can actually uh, make a person who is a jerk more of a jerk. Mm-hmm. Or in the context of, let's say, Wall Street, it can make a guy who's a jerk, a very focused jerk, who's very much able now to uh, 
make money, uh, but not necessarily uh, be nice. And so uh, she focused on the other two parts of this, which I think are very important. And the first has to do with this negative dialogue. All of us have a negative dialogue. And uh, of course, it may vary in its uh, severity, if you will, uh, for each person. But all of us have this thing going on in our head that says we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, uh, we're an imposter, people are going to find out. And this is a manifestation of what we know from our evolutionary development, where we attend to things that put us at risk. Uh, right. As an example, if you see the grass moving um, in the jungle on the savanna in Africa, you know, that may, it probably represents a animal that uh, wants to attack you or something. Uh, and again, to preface that, our DNA has not changed for 200,000 years. So we're that same animal, if you will, on the other side of it, being stalked. Yeah. And as a result, we're highly attuned to threat because by avoiding uh, risk or avoiding those types of situations, it allows our species to survive. But it's very sticky. And sure. unfortunately, this overlaps with negative commentary. So many of us carry these negative statements uh, as a result. But what I didn't know and appreciate was that you had the ability to change the dialogue uh, to one of positivity, self-affirmation, acceptance. And as a result, it changes how you see the world. Because when you're hypercritical all the time, uh, to yourself, which many of us are, uh, uh, you then look at the world through the lens of being hypercritical and judgmental. So once she taught me this technique of being kind to myself, it mm -hmm. made me understand and appreciate that on some level, everyone is suffering. So it allowed me to be self-compassionate and also see the true nature of reality, if you will, which is all of us are suffering and uh, everyone deserves kindness, everyone deserves acceptance, everyone deserves non-judgment. And so this was very, very powerful uh, for me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last thing she taught me was uh, actually a technique of manifestation. And uh, of course, in sports psychology, now that's a, a very uh, um, powerful thing, but it's also available in everyday life. And uh, what she taught me was to uh, write down uh, 10 things that I wanted, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, to read those multiple times a day to myself, to read them out loud, and then to visualize them actually manifesting. And this was a very powerful for, uh, technique for me because prior to my interaction with her, I felt a sense of hopelessness, despair, lack of direction. And then from that point on, I felt uh, that the possibility existed. I could go to college or uh, ultimately become a doctor. And uh, so it had a huge, huge impact on my confidence and my perspective of how I saw the world. And fundamentally, of course, it changed my life. Yeah, for sure it did. Um, you know, can we... I think you could bring up a really good point about if you don't, and I like the way you put it in the book, if you don't let your heart be your compass, then you can kind of be like that pompous asshole, if you will, right? And and you kind of were on both sides, right? That's what's really great about the book is is you, I, I don't know if it was like, or, or, or was it that you were so young when you received this this um, this wisdom from Ruth that you just couldn't even understand that like the heart could do something like that for you. So instead of like taking the whole practice and, and incorporating it into your entire life, that you just worked with uh, what really felt good and also achieving such wonderful results at, at uh, um, and by using these practices that you kind of forgot about the heart. If you can maybe take us through that yin and yang uh, of, uh, of your experience with these practices and maybe even dig a little bit if you have you know, uh, uh, the reflection on why, you know, people becomes a jerk, you know, uh, in, if you don't use the heart um, with, uh, with just the using like two thirds of the practice instead of the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I mean, 
I think uh, each of us has probably run across people who nominally say they're mindful, but mm -hmm. remain jerks. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because on some level they get awareness, but they don't really process it um, well. And uh, it becomes about them. And in fact, uh, I've certainly had the experience of people telling me how mindful they are uh, in some ways like a Christian or a Buddhist or uh, whomever uh, is touting to you their proficiency at something or expertise or knowledge to make you feel inferior. And of course, uh, uh, you know, like I just went on a 10 day Vipassana retreat and I'm better than you. Uh, yes. well. <laughs> yeah, I have done 10 days, but I have not followed up with, uh, I've done it three times, by the way, and I'm better than everybody. That's not the case. Like, there's a tremendous amount. Here's three a classic times better. example yeah. of what I was saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I know. You should actually listen. You should actually, everyone should go out and listen to the wisdom that I brought into the episode on Vipassana that's on this that podcast so where you can hear. Yeah, what an asshole yeah. I am because of these Well, uh, <laughs> at least we've given him a little bit of self-awareness during this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And more uh, right here. <laughs> but, uh, but that oftentimes uh, is the case. And uh, I think in my particular instance, um, I did not have the maturity or the knowledge to understand uh, the entire gift I was given. Mm. Uh, and what happened is that I certainly understood the manifestation. I certainly understood the relaxing the body and, and the um, breathing techniques. But I did miss something. And what happened was that I did not resolve the issue of the baggage that uh, I was carrying as a result of my traumatic childhood. And so as I went about uh, sort of, uh, if you want to call it, quote unquote, succeeding in life, mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, about um, the other necessarily, although I was never a bad guy in any way, mm -hmm. but it was about me. And so whatever the accomplishment was, which was, as an example, you know, going to college or medical school or becoming a neurosurgeon or a successful entrepreneur, I was climbing these mountains with the belief that if I just got to the top of the next mountain, I would be okay. Right. And of course, what happened was that I got to the top of the mountain and, and nothing changed. You know, yeah. there was no magical revelation. And uh, uh, so the mistake that I made, uh, which was had multiple parts, was one, uh, I had not connected with the shame, the insecurity, the baggage that I was carrying. And I believe falsely that if I did these things, that would take care of it. If people just liked me, if yeah. people saw how great I was because I did X, Y, or Z, that I would feel okay. Now, of course, the reality is acceptance of yourself and your imperfections uh actually is the first uh, step towards happiness. Happiness mm -hmm. does not manifest as people telling you you're okay or you're great. Uh, happiness occurs when you understand that you're a frail, fragile human being, that you are not perfect, and that your focus should not be on these types of things to impress others, because that will never make you happy the important thing is to be of service because when you care for others, when you connect for others, that's actually what really um, shifts you uh, into your parasympathetic nervous system or this rest or digest system, which makes you much more open, mm -hmm. um, authentic, and allows for true human connection. So it really was only after I... Um, if you will, became nominally successful by traditional societal standards, mm -hmm. if you want to call it the typical rags to riches story. But, you know, when I reached that pinnacle or reached the top of the mountain, I realized that uh, I was not rich at all. There was nothing there. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so it took a traumatic event, uh, and I won't necessarily uh, go into deep detail about it, certainly uh, in the book, but uh, I ended up uh, losing everything financially uh, during the dot-com crisis. Uh, it ended up uh, being you know, about $80 million, and uh, I had to sell off everything. Yep. And, uh, uh, and then I went through a period of reflection. And interestingly enough, uh, there was a company I had been the CEO of, and I had given that stock to charity because I thought it was easy to make all that money and uh, I would be just fine. And uh, so here I am in this position of self-reflection. I'm $3 million in the hole. I have to sell my house, my cars, my Ferrari, you know, Porsche. Cetera, you went big, man. You went really big, Jim. You went big. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway. I think he was, I think he was uh, you in know, the process of buying an island at the time, too. <laughs> Oh, that's yes, right. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and I had a 6,000-acre a island, and I had a villa in Florence and all these things. That's right. And, and, you know, I used to fly around in private jets and, you know, I think I was particularly important. And, uh, uh, and so what happened is um, when this type of situation occurs, you have two people who become your best friends. One is your banker and one is your lawyer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Uh, When I met with my lawyers to figure out what the hell I was going to do, uh, it turned out that this charitable uh, donation I had sort of nominally was making to these different institutions, they had actually never completed the paperwork. So I could have taken all of that money back. Right. And, uh, you know, after a long period of reflection, I realized that all that money was not going to make me any happier. And so I went ahead and gave it all away, which was $30 million. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, in the face of being $3 million in the hole. Now, I have to tell you that at the time, it seemed like the right decision, and it allowed for a lot of positive things to occur. But as my uh, future wife told me at that moment, she said, well, um, I think it's great you being generous, but you don't have to give everything away. Uh, and uh, that was probably true on some level. Uh, uh, you could have kept three uh, million and and settled yeah. your debts, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So as a result, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time sort of paying that back as well as uh, trying to acquire some other wealth. But the important point of this story is that it made me realize that my happiness was not connected to success or accolades in a traditional uh, sense, and to that while I was, as I mentioned, never a bad person, everything was about me to deal with my shame and insecurity. It wasn't about a being of service to others. And I made that mental shift, which took me from, uh, again, uh, uh, from, if you will, poverty or uh, uh, this idea of impoverishment to one of wealth that had nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. Uh, What this uh, allowed me to do was, one, appreciate that certainly uh, money is not the basis of happiness. Two, that um, when you care for others, when you're of service to others, it uh, the side product of that is you do get uh, the other aspects of this, if you so choose, which are uh, some of the uh, aspects of quote unquote societal success. Uh, you know, I have no problem driving a Ferrari or living in a nice house at all, as long as you keep it in context. You know, if you're of service to others, if you give, if you're generous to others, if you walk the walk, there's no uh, negative aspect of that. But the key is that you're not attached to it. Mm, So if everything gets taken away tomorrow, nothing changes in my mental attitude. Mm. Uh, I'm very confident that uh, things will always work out for me. Um, And I think that's really a key point. You know, so many people are fearful that they're, quote unquote, not going to succeed. And this is uh, actually a manifestation of the messaging from our society, which is a consumer culture driven by corporate self-interest. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes by our families who say, well, if you don't go to college or if you don't do this, mm -hmm. or if right. you're not like me, you're nothing. And of course, nothing could be more toxic to a child than having their value as a human being tied into some sort of external accomplishment. You right. know, I tell my own children, uh, I don't care whether you go to college or not. The only thing I care about is you being kind and compassionate and caring and loving to others. All the other stuff is BS. If you mm -hmm. do those things, you will be happy. If right. you chase after money and power and position, and that is your primary driver, you will not only uh, be unhappy, but you will be disliked by a lot of people. Mm. Right. Now, with that in mind, um, you know, in, in the book, you, you tell some, some heart-wrenching stories of how you had to work on patients who ultimately succumbed to their injuries or their illnesses and the compassion that you showed to their loved ones and the compassion that you showed to them as they were going into surgery. I mean, the book starts with you, you uh, spending some mm -hmm. time with your buddy or, uh, you know, this, this young kid who's going into surgery and you call him champ and buddy and how he's going to go. And so you spend a lot of time uh, expressing that compassion. Um, and with that in mind and with your position as founder and director of Sea Care. Uh, can you explain why compassion and kindness are so important and then how they are good for our own health? Sure. Well, just to preface, uh, uh, before I go into that, um, uh, being a physician is uh, a very challenging uh, job. It's challenging uh, both fr from the aspects of learning the technical aspects of it, especially for a neurosurgeon, and oftentimes an expectation that uh, you can solve all of the problems. And again, the reality is every one of us, no matter uh, how much we've trained, are frail, fragile human beings, and uh, we're not perfect. That being said, though, um, um, shit, I forgot my what was the question again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just uh, just asking you about you know why compassion and kindness oh. are so important, and then uh, you know just in general. And then how individually and physiologically they're actually good for our own health. Sorry, I, I'm, I, I think I'm getting senile. You know, my, my memory <laughs> keeps getting uh, shorter. We got our notes, well, Jim. We got you. We're yeah, going yeah. to carry well, you to the finish line. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I was doing a podcast with someone and, you know, I asked him like a question that had seven parts. And, and he goes, dude, I, I can only, <laughs> you're going to have to break these down so I can remember this. Uh, but uh, um, so uh, getting back to your question. Uh, if you look at our evolution as a species, and if you want to call it the nuclear family uh, initially, we are one of the few species who have a small number of offspring, and those offspring, unlike other uh, mammals uh, or uh, or fish or whatever, they don't uh, we don't swim away or run off into the jungle or the forest. To survive, we have to be cared for for 10, 15 years. For some of us, our children still require us after 20 or 30 years. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, when, as a species, we're highly attuned to the pain and the suffering of others because of our offspring. Uh, if our offspring are hungry, if they're crying, if they're in pain, we turn to them and care for them. And this is a huge cost in terms of time and resources. So why do we do it? Well, frankly, one of the reasons we do it is because when you care, uh, you actually have an, uh, it actually has an effect on your brain. And while we can talk about other uh, uh, hormones or neurotransmitters, the one uh, that most people have heard of is oxytocin. Uh, the love or caring hormone. And when this is released, you actually get a pleasurable uh, effect. Mm -hmm. And so when you're kind, when you care for another, you are rewarded by pleasure or a pleasurable feeling. And in fact, the areas of the brain that are associated with pleasure and reward 
are the same as for food or sex or um, money. And uh, so that's why we do it. That's why we expend the resources. If you look, though, the next step of our evolution, which was uh, hunter-gathered, excuse me, hunter-gathered tribes, which is how we lived uh, until six to 8,000 years ago in groups of 50 to 150. If a member of our tribe or our group did not uh, uh, do their job or were impaired or, if you will, suffering or in pain, that put the entire tribe at risk. So we were highly attuned to helping them. Hmm. And uh, so, and this has persisted. And in fact, uh, this caring actually has carried forth into to the creation of uh, a society and religion and other social groups, because uh, we thrive through human connection. And when you do have that connection, when you care for another, it shifts you again from this fear mode or engagement of your sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm to engagement of your parasympathetic nervous system. So what's the difference? Well, I'll com uh, compare and contrast, if you will. Please. If you're uh, anxious or fearful, uh, then several things happen. Uh, your blood pressure increases, your heart rate increases, your heart rate variability decreases, the expression of inflammatory proteins increases, which are associated with uh, the occurrence of chronic uh, disease states. Uh, your immune system is impaired, and uh, you have the release uh, of um, stress hormones such as cortisol, which on a chronic basis are very deleterious to your health. Uh, and in fact, uh, when there is a decrease in heart rate variability, uh, this is associated with the highest incidence of sudden cardiac death. So chronic engagement of your sympathetic nervous system clearly uh, is not uh, beneficial to you, either in terms of your mental and physical health, uh, but even in terms of your longevity and survival. And of course, quite the opposite is true when you are able to shift into the uh, rest and digest system or uh, the parasympathetic nervous system. The opposite occurs your blood pressure goes down, you feel calm. Mentally, you're generous, you're kind, you're thoughtful. And all uh, of your physiologic processes are the opposite of what I previously mentioned. So there's huge, huge benefit to being kind, caring, and thoughtful. And in fact, ultimately, uh, your telomere length of, of your genes increases, which of course is associated with increased longevity. As an example, uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of the blue zones right. uh, in the yep. world. And these are those places where people typically survive uh, over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, five that are typically uh, mentioned. And of course, uh, most of these are in the Mediterranean, if you will, or in places where people have diets primarily of vegetables and fish, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, you know, it's always interesting. There are a million Mediterranean diet cookbooks as if, you know, if you just eat this way, but you're still an asshole, you're going to live long. <laughs> yeah, uh, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's not true. Uh, right. In fact, if you look at the statistics, by far, far and away, the most important aspects of longevity relate to human connection and deep relationships period those by far far and away are much more important to diet now this is not to say you shouldn't eat a healthy diet or you shouldn't exercise but they are more important relationships connections uh in fact more important than being at your ideal wall, uh, body weight or even quitting smoking i mean that's wow. how powerful uh, uh this connection is and again, getting back to what we discussed earlier, being able to connect, having a calm mind, uh, not being in fear, not being anxious, allows you to be present. And mm -hmm. this, of course, then creates uh, authenticity and human connection. And that is the most powerful gift you can give to somebody. 
Uh, and that's what people forget. You know, people run around, uh, uh, you know, doing every diet possible, uh, you know, uh, spending all their time. Yeah. But really just sitting with somebody and connecting with them is actually uh, uh, extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with people who've done everything, right? They're slim. They eat the perfect diet. They take every fucking nutraceutical possible yep. and and then they keel over uh, when they're 40, right? Yep. Then you have guys probably like me who are somewhat overweight and uh, uh, <laughs> eat, <laughs> likes ice cream. And, uh, and that's why you're cream. overweight. That's why yeah, you're yeah. both overweight. Uh, yeah, I don't eat ice cream, hey. gentlemen. Uh, uh, but, but, you know uh, what? Uh, but we're compassionate, Will. We're oh, compassionate. sorry. sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking of the numbers. I'm using my brain instead of my heart. Yes, I yeah. apologize. There, there you go. That's, <laughs> yeah. Again, we, we keep re emphasizing your issues there. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. This is turning into a therapy session. Thanks, yes, guys. Yes. Thanks. I really yes. needed this. Uh, 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 at the end of this, I need your insurance uh, uh, card. <laughs> All right. Fine, Jim. You can have. OK. <laughs> I love it, Jim. And, and actually, awesome. in, in, in the book, uh, I love how you said uh, many misinterpret Darwin by implying that survival of the fittest means the survival of the strongest and most most mm -hmm. ruthless, when in fact it is survival of the kindest and most cooperative that ensures the survival of a species in the long term. We evolved to cooperate, to nurture and raise our dependent young and to thrive together and for the benefit of all. Uh, and well, that right there, I mean, if you're listening, that right there, I mean, we could, we could close the show right there. I'm not going to close the show there because I know <laughs> Jim has much more to say, but it, it's just uh, very profound and you just echoed it there uh, in, your, in your commentary. So I, I love that you, you spelled that out in the book. Well, that was a fucking profound statement. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> we are too, Jim. We, we are too. Like, <laughs> we, we've had authors come on several times and we've read something from the book and they're like, did I fucking write that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you, you know, it's uh, interesting and I, I, I am very appreciative. Don't get me wrong, but there are people because, you know, this book started out at probably 400 pages and of course it has to be edited down. Sure. And, uh, uh, so a couple things happen. One is, <laughs> it's always interesting. Somebody says, you know, I read the book and I'm really disappointed because you only devoted two pages to your family. Or, geez, I bought this book because I wanted to learn about neuroscience and it really wasn't that in depth for me. Or the other is, uh, uh, I thought this was a book about neurosurgery and it's it's really not. Uh, and, you know, you're suddenly going, Jesus Christ. I, I, I mean, uh, but... Uh, the other aspect is that there are people who read this book and, and for them it's extraordinarily profound and they will highlight it. They'll take notes. They'll put these little stickers on and I run into them at these events and they know these quotes and lines and they, and they actually know me better than I know myself. Right. So, <laughs> so, so they'll, they'll be quoting all this stuff. And I go, Oh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually bad sometimes because, you know, the nature of this book, its openness and everything, uh, makes people feel that you're their friend and you're connected to them and they know you, right? Mm, so yeah. people come up and go, Jim, oh God, it's so great to see it. I'm like, who the fuck is this person? <laughs> <laughs> compassionately, compassionately. In a, in a, no, no, I've always, uh, I'm listen, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I hug a lot of people, but it is embarrassing <laughs> sometimes because I, I'm processing. Do they know me because of the book? Did I meet them somewhere and somehow forgot about this, yeah. uh, which is also possible? So yeah. it's uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, actually. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to try to redeem myself, gentlemen. OK, I'm going to read right, from your book, go. too, because what I would like to get to next and, and then also kind of um, slip into maybe the alphabet of the heart and then into Sea Cares, uh, the great work that you're putting out there in the world and uh is, so let me read this. So because what I really enjoy what we talked about earlier is like using um, being having being mindful in the sense of stacking up accomplishments, stacking up successes and, and, and living kind of the Western philosophy of just accumulating things instead of uh, living through your heart, which is something that you had to learn the hard way after losing, I think it was $72 million during the dot-com era. 78, but who's counting? Oh, 70, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I'm just losing on all levels today. 70, <laughs> good. Here we go. The mind wants to divide and keep us separate. 
it will teach us to compare ourselves, to differentiate ourselves, differentiate ourselves, to get what what's ours because there is only so much to go around. The heart, however, wants to connect us and wants us to share. It wants to show us that there is no difference and that ultimately we are all the same. The heart has an intelligence of its own. And if we learn from it, we will we will know that we keep what we have by only giving it away. If we want to be happy, uh, we make others happy. If we want to love, we have to we have to give love. If we want joy, we need to make others joyful. If we want forgiveness, we have to forgive. If we want peace, we have to create we have to create it in the world around us. If we want our own wounds to be healed, we have to heal others. Um, thanks for this one, James. This is great. Um, and then, and then, like the next paragraph, you talk about what Ruth called the compass of the heart is really a form of communication. So, well, why don't we take us through this and what you're also uncovering? Like this really opened up a a giant uh, inspiration in you as far as like beginning to under you know take your science background as a neurosurgeon and um, and a neuroscientist and and, and understand uh, how the heart works and why it works that way. So what was the question? <laughs> okay, yeah. the question uh, you, great. Yeah. The question is, uh, take us over like, so tell us, how about this? Take us through the alphabet of the heart and uh, what your understanding and what your organization is doing to help others like bring it into uh, uh, their lives. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dude, what am I going to do with you, man? Uh, I don't know. Jim, Jim, you and I need to get together and have beers and talk about what Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah. Why, why don't you and I just do this podcast and get rid of this guy? Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are awesome. I really, we're, we're, I'm uh, feeling the love. Here, I'm feeling the love. I'm, I'm just, I'm taking in his love, guys. I'm taking in his love. It's love. It's <laughs> love, right? Uh, what was the question? Uh, uh, <laughs> The alphabet of the heart. The alphabet of the heart. So uh, let me give a little background of that. Uh, so uh, here I was an individual. And again, for those of you who have not read the book, I was not a stellar student as an undergraduate uh, because I had a lot of personal stuff going on where I had to leave college multiple times. I couldn't really concentrate. I didn't have uh, a lot of money, and as a uh, result, um, I uh, uh, you know struggled. But I did get into med school, and it's uh, again, if you read the book, it's actually quite a amazing story uh, because Great I had story. a two point uh, two point five three average, I think, at the time. Uh, but once I got into med school, I did perfectly fine, and ultimately, as a, a resident, et cetera. But uh, the alphabet of the heart came about because here I, by all normal criteria, should never have gotten into med school. I didn't have grade point average, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I did. And I was very, very, and remain very grateful uh, that uh, Tulane uh, Medical School accepted me. And I ended up actually, we talked about me giving $30 million away. I actually ended up giving part of that to my medical school because I was so thankful. And that actually funded um, an endowed chair for the dean of the medical school who uh, the prior dean had left following Hurricane Katrina. So he, that person, became the Doty professor uh, and remains the Doty professor at Tulane. But one of the honors they gave me was to ask me to speak uh, to the incoming medical students. And of course, uh, this is called the white coat ceremony. They receive a white coat, they take the oath of Hippocrates, and then there is a nominally inspirational speaker who comes uh, and speaks to them about uh, you know, the privilege and honor of being a physician. So I was that person. And uh, uh, so I wanted to give the students something that they could carry with them that was easy to remember mm. and reflected my own personal journey. And that ended up being uh, the alphabet of the heart. And so uh, what happened is I gave this talk and I gave them this gift and it's 10 letters of the alphabet. And of course, you know, in medical school, you have to use mnemonics to remember things. And so it, uh, these 10 letters of the alphabet began with C, uh, compassion for self and others, D, recognizing the dignity of every person, 
E, practicing equanimity or evenness of temperament. Mm. F, practicing forgiveness. G, practicing gratitude. H, uh, having humility, which of course is hard for a neurosurgeon. <laughs> uh, I, 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 having integrity and values uh, and uh, behaviors that bound your, uh, in what you do. Uh, uh, J is for justice or our responsibility to care for those who are vulnerable. K is kindness, simply doing good for others. Uh, and they don't have to be suffering. That's just how you walk in the world. Right. And all of this is contained by love. And uh, so that is the alphabet of the heart. And uh, as a very quick story related to that, uh, of course, that got a standing ovation. Uh, um, and um, three months after that, a woman sent me an email and she said, listen, I'm a person of faith. Uh, I uh, am the spiritual director at the largest homeless shelter in the United States. Um, and I had Burn, become burned out from my job. I had resigned, and uh, on my last day at work, I was packing my box, and all my friends had given me scripture. Nothing helped me. I on my last day, someone shared with me your talk, and it gave me the strength to return to work, which wow. was you know how beautiful is that. A few yeah. months later, she sends me another email. She says, you know, we've instituted this with our clients, and it remains very powerful. We do it every morning. I'm going, oh my god, very powerful sends me a third email and now she's on stalker status right uh she sends me a, <laughs> she, she, she sends me a third email and she says listen jim this is so powerful uh that um i was sharing it with my best friend she has a daughter named jenny who's nine and jenny on her own uh made a set of beads wooden beads each one representing a letter of the alphabet and she added a golden bead to represent the golden rule would you mind if we sold that as a fundraiser for the uh, mm. homeless shelter and the peace center? And of course, I said, oh, my God, yes. And so then <laughs> another email. And she says, you know, this was so powerful. Uh, um, we made a video. And it was this little girl uh, holding the, on a gold, her hands on a golden cloth with uh, uh, these beads, stringing them. And this woman uh, talks about uh you know the the letters of the alpha the, the alphabet of the heart and you can find that actually if you look at um, uh, uh compassion beat san antonio subsequently her and i became very good friends and uh i actually flew down toured the homeless shelter gave a sermon in the church and uh and then um Later, I was hosting the Dalai Lama, and this woman had two heroes in her life, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, who she shared the same birthday. And so I was hosting the Dalai Lama, and I sent her note. I said, listen, uh, why don't you come out, and I want to introduce you to the Dalai Lama. And she sent me a note back, and she said, you know, I, I have very li limited means. I'm not able to do that. I can't afford it. I said, well, I'm hiring you as a consultant. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so I invited her out. Uh, I said, bring some beads. We'll have His Holiness uh, uh, bless them. And oh, she wow. did. And she got to meet the Dalai Lama, which, of course, uh, was amazing for her. And he blessed these beads. We had a wonderful time. So then uh, a few years later, and again, like I said, we remained friends. She, um, uh, I was giving a talk in Oslo, and I was invited to uh, Tutu's 85th birthday party. Mm. And I, I called her up and I said, listen, you have to do me a favor. <laughs> I'm not able to go to Cape Town. Will you go in my place? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. So I, I sent her down. There. I paid her way down there. And uh, 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 she got to meet her other hero. And in some ways, the point of the story is, well, yes, that cost me some money. That money in no way changed my life, but it changed her life, right? All right. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, in some ways, on a closing note, this is something that we should never forget is that oftentimes people will sit there and say, you know, I don't have the means, I don't have the position, I don't have the money to make a change in the world or really to uh, affect change and help people. And the reality is each of us every day has the ability to make a positive impact on another person's life. And if there's anything that you get out of this conversation today, I think that's the most important thing mm -hmm. is each of us can have that impact. 
you know, uh, uh, are, are potentially we going to be a Mother Teresa or recognized on that level throughout the world? Uh, probably not for most of us, but it doesn't really matter. Right. The only thing that matters is do you care for others? Do you demonstrate it? And, and can you walk in those shoes and be confident and accept yourself for who you are mm-hmm. with your own uh, failures, with your own mistakes, mm-hmm. and still say, you know, it's okay. I love myself. I deserve to be loved. And uh, my presence in this world is to help others. That's beautiful, Jim. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, We didn't get to CK. Go ahead, John. Yeah. I think on that note, we'll probably start to wrap it up Um, or or we will wrap it up Mm -hmm. for for the audience. uh, You know, you can find out more about Dr. Doty and Jim, Jim, Dr. Doty, and all he does at www.jamesrdotymd.com. We'll make sure that's in the show notes. His book, Into the Magic Shop, is available on Amazon. It's also available in multiple languages on his website. Again, that's www.jamesrdotymd.com. And another few bonuses on that website. He's got the alphabet of the heart compassion beads that he was just talking about for sale on there. And he's even got Ruth's tricks recorded in audio form for you to listen to. So amazing site there with a lot of great resources. Um, as far as wow, New York City, I've got to have some. Uh, yeah, sorry. In that background. <laughs> yeah, it's nice, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, as far as the closing practice, Jim, uh, again, I'm going to offer it over to you. But again, no pressure or expectations. If you would like to close it up, we'd love to offer that opportunity to you. Sure. So uh, I would like everyone uh, to find a comfortable position and um, close your eyes. And uh, to do what we did earlier, which is to initially begin with a deep, deep breath through your nostrils and just hold it for a few seconds and sit with that and then slowly release your breath through your mouth. And let's do that three times. In, hold it and release it. And as you're doing the next breath, I want you to think about that person in your life who was there for you, who cared for you, who gave you unconditional love, and feel that feeling you had, that warmth, the feeling that you were unconditionally loved, unconditionally accepted. I should take another deep, deep breath and hold it. And release that breath and feel that sense of being cared for, of the warmth that you have. And some of you may not have had a person like that but you have had someone who's shown you love and just sit and feel that feeling and how powerful that is and how that love changed your life allowed you to be who you are how it protected you and take another slow in breath and let it out and slowly open your eyes. And as you do that, remember that you have that same gift which you can share with another. Thank you for spending time with me today. And it's really a joy. And if I can help any of you uh, please drop me a note at jrdoty at stanford.edu and much love to each and every one of you. Thank you, Jim. Very much Thank an honor having you here with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, obviously, I'm a very troubled individual and I'm going to be taking your Cultivating the Heart course through your C-Cares. Uh, that's going to start <laughs> September 28th. No, I really, I, I, this is an eight-week course just to help, you know, 
plug more of the work that you're putting out there, Jim. I'm going to be a part of that course. And uh, it's a, a, a Wednesday, September 28th. Uh, it starts. Um, uh, yeah, this Cultivating the Heart course, which I'm really excited to take. So thank you, Jim, for your time today and all the work that you're putting in the world. And I uh, wish we had more time to kind of dive into more of the work that you're doing. But we got to say goodbye. Thank you. Well, we, we can have version two, although I have to really reflect on that with, you know, you involved in this. But. <laughs> God damn it. All right. You know, I'll, how about this? Next time we do the show, John will have a, John will be on the screen and I'll hide my face. Maybe that'll make things a little bit better. Just, just, just the thought of that's already a blessing. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you so Brutal, much man. for everyone. Yeah, I know. Hey, it's good. That, that's a raw, uncut, unapologetic, right? We lived up to those three <laughs> words again on the show. Uh, thank everybody for listening. Uh, Jim, Dr. James Doty, thank you again for taking your time and putting this great book out in the world. You have another book actually coming out in 2023, what is called Mind Magic. Is that correct? Yes, um, the neuroscience of manifestation and how it changes everything. Beautiful. Okay. On that note, peace, everybody. Thanks for being here. And uh, let me see if I can do this whole thing. Okay. Oh, wait, <laughs> can graphics. You? I, 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 oh, this, I think I'm going to do it right now. Okay. Bye. Sure John, we need Joining us today, we hope you walk away with some new tools and insights to guide you on your life journey. New episodes are being published every week, so please join us again for some meaningful discussion. For more information, please check out mentalkingmindfulness.com.